Well, hey, Grove family, so good to be with you at the four o'clock service. Uh, my name is Grantham. I get to serve here on staff at the church. And whether you're joining us online, in the courtyard, or here in the worship center, uh, we're so excited to be worshiping with you today. Now, I need to know, who just came from the pumpkin patch outside? Anybody? Woo! Got it. All right, now, who's planning to go to the pumpkin patch after? There it is. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, we're so excited that we get to do uh, community events like this um, that get to serve the just city of Riverside. We're, we're excited about that. Um, and if even if this is your first time here, uh, we would love to just invite you to fill out the, the Connect card that we have either digitally, online, or in your bulletin. You can drop that off in the offering box or bring it over to Guest Central after service. Uh, we would love to just get to meet you and and hear your story. Uh, we have two opportunities for parents that we want you to be aware of. Um, if you're a parent and you have a child that, that suffers with um, mental health or anxiety or depression, uh, we as a church actually want to support you in that. Uh, we have a parenting class this November um, that talks and addresses these subjects. Uh, and we also have even a support group for, for parents uh, of children with uh, disabilities. So we would love for you to connect uh, with those ministries. And if you have any questions, you can look in our bulletin uh, where there's more events on there as well. Uh, but right now, let's do what we came here to do. Let's stand together and let's give God the glory he deserves.
sing that one more time. Your presence. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now. Your presence is an open door. How many desire God's presence tonight? Because we know that in his presence, things change. Well, first off, is there anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight, to worship the Lord, to lift up our hands, to lift up our voices, and to sing about this great God? Well, why don't we take this moment to sing this song together? This song simply just says, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, because literally in his presence, things do change. So why don't we honor his name this afternoon by singing that together? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall So as we recap on our love offering, which simply says, fear God forever, we're going to sing a song tonight that we wrote last year that simply encompasses that entire chapter and that entire verse. So I want you to join in with us and sing this song together. You are the sun by day. The stars by night, we see who you are. We'll sing of your wonders. The heavens declare your name, the winds and the waves obey. we fear your God exalted so we sing Sing the next verse together. Say, we lost your heart, your way. We lost your heart, your way. Broken and sin and shame. We forgot who you are. We forgot who you are. But still you are free.
lift your name forever, say forever. Let's sing clean this song together for all your names. Here we go. For all our days, we'll sing your praise. We'll sing your praise forever. Forever. For all our days. For all our days. We'll fear your name. We'll fear your name. Forever. 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 For all our days. For all our days. We'll sing. Your God exalted. You are the God we fear. You are the God we fear. Your God exalted. Let's sing it one more time. So we sing. God, our God, will fear you forever. God, you are our God. We will fear you. We will honor you. We will trust in you. And we will give you praise forever. God, we're so thankful and honored to be able to give you praise freely in an open atmosphere like this. So as the service continues, God, we pray that you would continue to do the work that you've already begun on your people. It's in your precious son Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say amen. Amen, amen. Hey, do me a favor. Why don't you turn to your right, to your left, your front, back. Greet somebody tonight before you take your seats, all right? There's a lot going on at the church this weekend, is there not? And you got all the soccer that's going on with an estimated 5,000 people that come to our church every single weekend just to watch soccer. We have the pumpkin patch going on where last year we had around 5,000 people show up to that. And then we also have weekend services where about 5,000 people show up to that as well. Uh, when you think about that, maybe you just wandered in here and you don't even know where you're at right now. Uh, this is the reason why we come together to worship the Lord. And we're so thankful that you're here. Uh, this church could not exist without our volunteers all the volunteers that make it happen, from soccer to the pumpkin patch to our uh, kids' ministry, all those. Can we just thank our volunteers one more time, all that they do? They really do a phenomenal job. I mean, I work here, and I'm blown away by all that happens here all the time. Uh, so I, I thank God to, to, to be on this team. Uh, one of the things I'm also thankful for is just our staff, all that our staff does. And we're always trying to look for new ways to appreciate them and thank them for what they do. Uh, because they do, they do a lot and they do a really good job. Uh, yeah, we can clap for the staff. I, are, do you work here? <laughs> I'm just, if you do, it's good. Um, but we talked about putting together a plan to honor our staff, and David Reynolds really took the lead on that. Uh, at one year, we do something special. At five years, at, at 10 years, and so forth. Uh, and our leadership team put together a plan of how we can honor people and had the idea that once they get to 35 years that we'd like to bring them up in front of the church just to show our appreciation for all the hard work that, that they have done. Uh, so 
The first person on our staff who just hit 35 years since implementing this new program, wouldn't you know, it's Carol Lance. Yeah. I just think God's timing is perfect. I really do in everything. God's timing is perfect. And I couldn't think of a better person for our church to honor today than you, Carol. So would you welcome Tom and Carol as they come up here and we honor them. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put them right here if you want, but get a picture. Put them down. I love you. Feel free to set them down too, Tom. You good? Uh, you, you may be seated. We're going to talk for a quick second. Um, the fingerprints of Carol Lance are all over this church. And if you've been here for some time, you know that. Uh, I know you worked here as an accountant, not when Tom was senior pastor, just for the record, uh, before, before that. Uh, serving our women's ministry and building it into what it is today phenomenal teacher. Um, you're so good at details, but you're relational and you love people so well, Carol. Natalie was supposed to be up here with me, but our kids got sick in the middle of the night. You know how that goes, so I have to preach. <laughs> but she wanted to say this too. She, she wrote this out and she said, when she's watched you the last 15 years, you're the perfect partner for Tom. Everything that Tom needed and this church needed um, God blessed us with you, and you can see your giftings from the visionary, this is where we need to go, to the details, and this is how we're going to get it done, Carol, and you. And when Natalie said she looks at you and who you are for Tom, that you're the perfect person for Tom, that has even given her confidence not to try to be you, but to be the perfect person for me, and that you've even helped her find confidence in the role that she's in now. So I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, from, from Natalie and I, but for our whole church, for what a blessing you are to the Grove years ago and to this very day. Can we thank her one more time? I asked Carol to say something, an acceptance speech. <laughs> so Carol? All I wanted to say is working for the Grove hasn't felt like I've worked for the Grove. I have served alongside you. You have loved me, I have loved you. We have done things that were impossible to do without God helping us. And I just can't imagine having worked anywhere else as fulfilling as this job has been. I, e even now with the past several months with my surgery and the cancer and the chemo and everything that's going on, the way the church has allowed me to come in and work as I can and get things done, has given me strength, has made me feel so much better than sitting home feeling lousy, and uh, it has allowed me to continue to serve in the way that God created me to serve. And then the love that you all have shown me has been, Tom and I are blown away from the the cards, the flowers, the food, the gifts, the, I mean, you, and it's still, I, I woke up today and I, I have more cards in the mailbox. Your, your prayers, your love, it's, I got paid to do this and you just do it. And <laughs> you are God's hands and feet in a way that I just couldn't imagine living life without you. And so I thank you for letting me be a part of the team and help serve you these past 35 years. Well, we love you, Carol. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. I got you. Don't even worry about it. Well, we got them a couple nights stay in Laguna and a nice steak dinner that they can enjoy. If you don't know this, Carol loves steak and she likes it rare. If you didn't know that, <laughs> it always makes me smile when I hear her order. <laughs> uh, but we love, we love you, Carol, very much. Uh, like Kristen said, uh, today we are concluding our series, Fear God Forever, our annual theme. If you're new to the Grove, we always have an annual theme. Uh, we start it in mid-October, and we, and we go to mid-October. 
uh, which means that we're actually starting a new annual theme that we'll introduce to the church next weekend. Uh, we'll introduce a new annual theme. We'll introduce the new book that we're going to study for 2024. We'll introduce uh, love offering projects that we're going to do as a church. Really, if you're new to this church and you're trying to figure out if God's calling you to be a part of this church, it, it is a, a great series for you to come to because really what we're doing is we're sharing our vision for 2024. Uh, but how can we start by sharing our vision for 2024 by not even just taking a moment to reflect on what we believe God did in 2023 and also try to recap what it really means to fear God forever because it's just such a big idea. Have you gotten your mind around it? Do you know what it means to fear God forever? Could you explain it to your family and your friends if I told, brought you up here and has pointed at one of you said, come up here and explain to the church what it means to fear God right now? <laughs> Make you nervous, huh? <laughs> but that's what this sermon is really going to be, be about. But first, even just every year in the, in the, for our love offering, uh, this church, people come to this church for the outreach that we do um, because we want to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ here in the city and around the world. And we do that through the general fund giving, but we also, this church is so generous, we also raise a million dollars a year and we give it away through a variety of gifts or a variety of projects. And here's 40, 44 different projects. Uh, so last year, once again, we asked for a million dollars and here's some of the numbers. Uh, you pledged and started giving November 22nd, $1,080,000. That was of November last year. Total received through the beginning of October 2023 this year is $1.5 million that has come in to do those things, which is, which is amazing. Um, it's not a competition. I mean, we're always competing against ourselves, but that's $100,000 more than the year prior. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, it really is amazing how generous of the church this is. Now, that's just to the beginning of October, so we still have money coming in October uh, as well, and we could get up to $1.7 million when it's all said and done. As you know, I, I say this every time I talk about this, but there's also a generous family in the church where anything given above a million dollars is matched by that family up to $500,000, and that goes to pay down debt. So we will be paying down over a million dollars worth of debt uh, come December is when we'll make that payment. We're getting close, man, praise the Lord, yeah, it's awesome. We are coming closer and closer to being completely paid off. Uh, God willing, we'll be paid off in 2025, which will be our 100-year anniversary as a church. And if you want to know also just God's timing in this, someone asked me when we we're uh, honoring Carol, I was like, has Carol been here longer than Tom? No, no, she hasn't. Tom's been here for, since he was like 13 years old. And he's on, I believe, your 48th year. But knowing Tom's heart, I know that he would want us just to honor Carol. Um, because the time will come we're going to honor him in two years. When, in 2025, it'll be his 50-year anniversary working here as well, which is, which is just incredible, really, the faithfulness of, of this couple. Um, so as, as a church and by the grace of God, uh, really, um, we were able to complete every single project in here. We have the projects that are up on uh, the screen. I'm not going to be able to go through them one at a time. It would take too long. Uh, there's only one project that we didn't complete in Nepal. It was a bakery. Uh, I don't think it's because of celiac disease out there. They just changed their vision. The missionaries did. So <laughs> it's a lame joke, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, they changed their vision. They did something else, and we still gave them the funds for it. So every single thing has been done. I'll point out a couple of the things that we were able to do as a church. Really, if I were to say the, the biggest thing that we did this last year was form an entire ministry among uh, reaching refugees and international students, really reaching the nations here in our own city. We formed a whole new department. We hired a new staff, a new staff member, and then we started reaching those that God is bringing to our city right now. Terry Logan's the person who's leading this and does just a phenomenal job. Uh, some of the things that we were able to do this year because of the love offering, we did three big events with over 100 international students uh, coming to them. We also partnered with the Canes, who are our global local uh, partners in this area. Uh, we also collected and distributed furniture to refugees, uh, students, international students as well. That's something that you helped uh, us do. We also did an Easter progressive dinner where we had over 100 students show up, and then you opened up their, your homes, and we went to homes and shared the Easter story. I think over 70 students came to Easter service that coming weekend, uh, which we praise God for. We did a beach trip a couple weeks ago. 
Grove members, you guys, I mean, we have close to 50 Grove members that will volunteer for every single event that we do. You're having students over to your house and reading the Bible with them and taking them to church. If you are an international student here today, we just want to tell you, you are welcomed here. We love you, care for you, and hope that you'll learn about the God that we serve and honor while the Lord has you in our, in our country. Hope you'll feel loved by the Grove, whether or not you believe in God at this point in time. Uh, some other things that we started, we started an ESL class because there's many people in our city who do not speak uh, English. We've had 10 different nations represented. We have on average 10 uh, people show up every single week. In fact, uh, one of my buddies uh, uh, from high school texted me, me this week and said, hey, Daniel, thanks for the ESL classes that you guys do. Now, it's interesting. I, I grew up playing soccer in the soccer team that I was on at Poly. We had the newcomer program there. Um, I was one of the only white kids on the, on the team. Everyone was Spanish speakers. We had a translator. And that was actually one of the kids that texted me, just saying, hey, thanks a lot, because he knows the blessing of just learning English. And we're doing it here at the church, so they can also make relationships with other people who go here and maybe come to know our God as well. So uh, it's very intentional why we do these things. We also did a five-day ESL class, had 48 students come to that, parents as well, as they played soccer and did things like that. We've helped different people, refugees in our church also, with buying things so that they can work. One of uh, families in our church, a Ukrainian family, bought him tools. Remember that? I think we have pictures up on here. Do we have pictures of that? Maybe it was already up there and we took it down. Yeah, so we bought, we bought tools for him, and he's actually now buying things for other refugees so they can work. Um, we've had people in our church hire refugees um, that give them jobs from our church family. If you're interested in doing that, you can talk to Terry Logan. So I could go on and on. It's just such a big ministry that was started by the love offering because of your faithfulness and giving. I mentioned this already, other things that we did. Um, we helped put a roof on a church in Mexico. Uh, here's a picture of that up here. Uh, they didn't have a roof and now they do have a roof through your giving. We also even helped with infant formula uh, in Malawi. Actually, a guy I went to high school with, the Herodos, um, they worked with Bright Vision Orphan Care and uh, it's just so expensive for formula there. Uh, because of the Grove, your generosity, uh, you helped care for over 30 babies, ensuring proper nourishment and growth for these vulnerable children, while they also share the love of Christ with families who are trying to adopt. Uh, we also did our capital project this year was to take two smaller classrooms in uh, the B building and turn it into one, because we have so many more people and kids coming right now. We need a bigger space. So we broke off a fourth grade ministry. Now you can see the pictures up here where there's live worship. It's a larger space for more kids to reach in. The love offering helped do that. We also built two homes for refugees in, in Belize, the Bay of Vista homes. Uh, we've been going to Belize for seven years now with our men's ministry. Interesting thing that we realized though in building this home, there were other homes like this when we came back this time. And we found out that the government actually stole, uh, not stole, but is using um, our model home and building it for others as well. So just seeing how God is even multiplying the faithfulness of this church, which praise the Lord for that as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones too. We bought a boat, uh, not for me, just so you know, <laughs> uh, but for our missionaries. We have a supported missionary in Mexico. He's raising people up and sending them out. And in Brazil, uh, they needed a boat to get to remote villages among the, uh, along the Amazon River so they can share the gospel. So through the, through the love offering, we bought, we bought that boat. Um, we're also continuing to support uh, a local church that's caring for um, Ukrainians leaving Ukraine, going to Poland. Whatever your political belief is on this war, the fact is people are fleeing in Poland. We sent women's ministry. In fact, Natalie and uh, some others went there as well as we're trying to help care for these people, and churches are being formed. Um, so we helped with food and blankets and these other things, and because of your support, the, the, the church can be the hands and feet of Christ. Um, so that's something that continued on. Also, we helped start a Eastern Mediter an Eastern Mediterranean church plant. And it's going to sound a little shady in how I'm saying this. We can't tell you exactly where it is and we have to block out their faces. <laughs> You're like, is this real? It is real, okay? It's just we live stream. But through your giving, um, we were able to start this church as well. I just listed off six of the 44. Uh, Pastor Joe Hobbs said this. I'm not done. I'm closing the book. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> you know? um, when you cut the grove, the grove bleeds outreach. And we're not just trying to do nice humanitarian things. We want people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. That is our mission that is our drive, 
and we are united together as a church being changed by God to reach all people. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So I wanted to let you know about those things and thank you and also take a moment just to praise God for what he allows us to do. I'm so thankful to be a part of this local church. I really am. Uh, I also praise God for what he taught us in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, I don't know if you've liked going through that. That's the hardest book I've ever preached through. Hardest book I ever outlined. <laughs> I mean, with the help of many others. We're not going to break down Jeremiah again. We're done. Okay, we, we, did, we did a conclusion of that in May. Uh, but I hope through that book, the Lord began to teach you what it looked like to fear him. We chose that book because it's really about a nation that stopped fearing God. They don't listen to God. They didn't do anything that God wanted them to do. And there's really one man, Jeremiah, who feared the Lord and was willing to go against culture and do what God called him to do. I mean, doesn't that sound relevant to, to today? A nation that no longer fears the Lord and saying, what about you? Are you going to fear the Lord? Are you going to do what God's calling you to do? Now, I asked you this, so I'll ask you again. What does it mean to fear the Lord? I want you to think about this, how you communicate it to others. Can you communicate to your friend, your family member, what it means for you to fear God forever at this point in time? Because why? Because God wants you to fear him. Our theme verse for this year was Jeremiah 32, 38 through 39, where God says, and, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart. I will give them one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after me. And what we saw in this is a nation that did not fear God, but God wants his people to fear him. So what does God do? God directs their steps into captivity for 70 years where they would acknowledge their sins and come back to a point of saying, God, I need you. My life is for you. And it was nothing they could have done on their own. God led them to a place of fearing him. And the fact that it was going to happen forever was because God knew that he was going to make this new covenant that would come from Jesus, the dying on the cross for our sins, that in Jesus dying and us inviting him into our life, that God would give you a heart to fear him forever. Because God keeps his children close to him and I hope that you saw this in, in Jeremiah as we studied these things together. Interesting enough, I mean, now in men's and women's Bible study, if you're a part of that, we're studying the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's talking about all the meaningless things in life. That if you just make your life about you going after what you want, whether it's possessions or wealth or sex or whatever it is, it will be, it'll be vapor. It'll be like chasing the wind. It's emptiness. And not to be a spoiler alert, but you should know by now, once we get to chapter 12 in a couple weeks, the author of Ecclesiastes comes to this point in saying this in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, the end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. So I ask you, do you know what it means to fear God? It's the whole duty of man. It's something for us to wrestle with. It's not something you're just going to arrive at today, but it's something to continue to wrestle with. Lord, what does it mean for me to fear you? This is, this is your duty. We have to get to the heart of what this means. We can't do it in a year, but we're going to have to get to the heart of what does it mean to fear the Lord, a realistic idea where like you can explain it to a kindergartner, like this is what it means to fear the Lord. How do you put it into words? I had lunch with a man from our church, a man I respect in our church, Dr. Andy Herity, a former board member here at the Grove, a former dean of business at CBU and a professor there to this day and wanted to talk to him about a couple things. So I had lunch with him back in the beginning of 2023. And while I was with him, I had him share his story with me. And as I'm listening to his life story, I'm sitting there thinking, my goodness, I can't believe that this is your story. I had no idea. And you're friends with my parents. You know, I had no idea this was your story. I said, Andy, would you share your story in front of our church? And he told me, no, Daniel, I will not. I was like, okay. I actually did not see that one coming. <laughs> uh, and I said, I want you to share your story and what it means for you to fear the Lord. He said, Daniel, it's such a big idea. I don't know if I could put it into words. I said, well, here, I want to give you this book and maybe this will help you as well. We're reading through it with our board. I, I tell you, if you still want, after I'm done everything, if you want to read a book on what it means to fear the Lord, this is, this is a fantastic book. Rejoice and Tremble by Michael Reeves. I, I use this a lot throughout the time of preaching through, uh, through Jeremiah. 
So he, re- he was reading the book, and I, I asked him a second time, I don't know, first, end of first quarter of 2023, Andy, are you ready to share? Would you like to share? And he told me no. I asked him a third time, Andy, are you ready to share? I'd love for you to share. And he told me no. Then after our wrist series that we did in May, he wrote me an email and said, Daniel, the wrist that I believe God's put on my heart is for me to share my story with the Grove. And I'm so thankful that he did. So enjoy the story that God has given Dr. Andy Herity. My name is Andy Herity. This is my story. The outbreak of uh, World War II happened quite quickly then, and Dad was conscripted into the British Army. Um, Dad was shot up very, very badly. There were complications from Dad's uh, being shot up during the war. He uh, eventually died when I was eight. He passed away, and um, that was hard. I didn't know him that well because he was gone so much, but still, it was it was hard. It was hard on Mom, I could tell. And um, then when I was 13, she had a brain aneurysm and, uh, and uh, died uh, quite quickly. Little brother and I, Frank and I, were, uh, were orphans. There was an aunt and uncle who lived in England who had no kids, and they agreed to take us in. On the way home from the funeral to their house, he wagged his finger at me and said, now, Andrew, big boys don't cry looking very serious, and uh, you know, it's burned in my memory that I wasn't welcome, and uh, walking into the house, I remember thinking to myself, I'm on my own here. Well, in school, I did okay, and I took to running, and I did well. Uh, one thing led to another, and then by high school, I was uh, national champion in cross country, the British Olympic Committee had already put me as um, someone on the roster for the 1968 Olympics. U- U.S. University started recruiting me <laughs> to come to the U.S. And, and run track. But the recruiting efforts of USC in Southern California really impressed me. Then at the end of that summer after high school, I boarded a plane uh, for uh, first for New York and then on to, uh, to California. So midway through freshman year, January, uh, there was a workout day. Coach gave the option. Some of us could go drive in his station wagon out to Malibu, and there was a big sand dune out there called the, the Dune, I think it is. So, you know, it's January of uh, Olympic year. And on one of the runs up, um, I knew something had gone wrong with my, my right leg down and do, do the Achilles area. Sure enough, I'd torn my right Achilles. I'd been fast-tracked by the British Olympic, Olympic Committee for the Olympics, and you know now the Olympics were coming up in just three or four months, and I was obviously out. Not gonna happen. They deselected me. Running had been, was, was the central thing in my life. Uh, it was my identity. It's how I thought of myself. It was, recognizing and understanding this was potentially a career ending injury, but definitely a season, an Olympics ending injury. And so things weren't working well. And after a dual meet in Tucson against the University of Arizona, got back and said to my roommate, you know, you go to church on Sundays, right? Would you take me with you? Because my grades are suffering. I can't make track work. Nothing's working in my life and I'm ready to try church. But within, the, within a month, on a Sunday or evening, there was an altar call, call. Anybody who wants to accept Jesus as your personal savior, come forward. And so I did, I got up, went forward, knelt, and I went, okay, Lord, I don't know what to do with my life. It's yours. I'm gonna give you my life. I accept you as my savior, and you're gonna be my Lord. You're going to be my master, the master of my life, because I'm out of options. I'm stuck. Uh, I'm on ac- academic probation. I don't know what to do. And so I gave my heart to the Lord. Earlier this year, at lunch with Daniel, had lunch with Daniel. He wanted to pick my brain on some things. He asked me to tell him uh, my story, so I did. And after the story, he asked me, would I be willing to tell my story on film as part of the Fear God, Fearing God series. And I, I said, no, no. Um, 
I don't know what it means to fear God. I don't have a sense of meaning of it, and so I don't feel like I could, I could tell my story authentically as a part of the Fear God series. And then one morning, I'd done my personal devotions, and I was chatting with my wife about uh, fearing God, and she asked me a question. She said, uh, are you trying to define fearing God? And I said, yes, I'm a professor, and one of the things I know is that you can think more clearly about things if you can define them. And so I'm looking for a definition of fearing God. But that got me thinking, I can't define God. So what if I'm not going to be able to define fearing God? And I went with that line of thinking. What if I can't define this? So what, then what does it mean to me without defining it? Well, it does mean to me depending on God, knowing how powerful he is, recognizing how powerful he is, and then knowing how he loves me and throwing myself on him, depending on him. It's not a definition for me. It's the thing that is fear that I can't define for you causes me to just depend on God as much as I possibly can, get myself out of the way and throw myself on him for whatever it is I'm, I'm doing in my life. And that's what fearing God means to me. I'm thankful to Andy that he'd be so bold to, to do that. Uh, there's a lot more material to it as well, and uh, that's the six-minute version. We have a 13-minute version as well that's going to uh, be online uh, if you want to watch that and hear more of that story. The thing that I think we can all relate to, though, is trying to, in maybe your mind, define what it means to fear God. And I would tell you, Andy's a very mature believer, uh, a solid man of God, and it's causing him to even wrestle and think through, okay, what does this mean? I, I, my hope is that even in, in you hearing his testimony, it'll make you think, how, how would you explain it? What does that mean to you? It's the duty of man to fear God. So to try to think through what that is, that's the purpose of this, of this sermon. You know, even throughout this year of talking about fearing God forever, when I read Scripture, I don't know if it's been the same for you, it's all over Scripture, fearing God. People who did fear God, people who did not fear God, I read Proverbs 14 this day, today, as you know, I always read a proverb a day. There was three verses on fearing God today in Proverbs 14. The one that I wrote down in my, in my journal, Proverbs 14, 2, says, whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who, who is devious in his ways despises him. So even that, just thinking through that in my mind, like, okay, Lord, if I'm upright in how I do things, that's an example of me fearing you. If I'm devious and I'm hiding something, I'm showing I despise you, that I do not fear you. I think that hits home with every single one of us in our lives because we can all be devious or sinful in the ways that we're doing things and, and tell God this, I despise you. Does your life show that you despise God? Being devious and sinful and doing whatever the heck that you want to do. Or are you living a life where you're trying to honor him, which actually shows that you do fear him. The reason why I was also so captivated by Andy's story is just, you know, it's just how the Lord was directing his steps. I mean, to think about the life that he went through, having his dad die at eight, having his mom die at 13, having to go to a family member's house where clearly is felt like that he wasn't wanted there, um, winning a, a national championship, my goodness, for Great Britain in high school, going to USC, another country, on the Olympic team, or at least being named to it, getting hurt, feeling just like, what the heck is going on, grades slipping, and coming to a point of like, I think I need to go to church. I think I need God. And then hearing the gospel and hearing how Jesus died on the cross for his sins and being saved. When I look at that, I just see God's hand all over Andy, leading him to a place where God would fear him. One of our designs this last year, Fear God Forever, if you remember all the colors, I mean, the colors represent chaos. Can you go to the one where it, it leads, like, it leads up to the point of just, like, fearing God? Think about the chaos in your life. Like, the things are just like, this is just, I can't believe this is happening to me. I would tell you that every single thing in your life is getting you to a place where you can fear 
the Lord today. God wants you to fear him. And it's a good thing. We're going to talk about that just in a, a, a little bit. You know, before I saw Andy's video, because it wasn't completely done yet, I, I, I wrote out my three points. I knew that I wasn't going to talk about Jeremiah because we already talked about Jeremiah. Tom was the one that encouraged me on it because I was deciding through a couple of things. He's like, Daniel, just share, share the three things that you learned. My point number one that I was going to share before hearing Andy's uh, video is that fearing God means putting God first. That's what it means. I mean, it means putting God first. That's even from Proverbs 14, too, that I just read um, a second ago, whoever walks in the brightness fears the Lord. That means that you're putting God first and you're doing what he wants or you're doing what you want. Are you doing what God wants or are you doing what, what you want? Someone who fears the Lord means they're going to put him first. Now, that's not point number one. I just told you that was my idea of listening to the video. Point number one, if you need to erase it, start erasing it. Point number one is actually is Andy's words. Uh, fearing God means depending and throwing yourself on God. That's what it means. And really, I would, I would paraphrase that. I'm just saying it means putting God first. Of like, I don't know what else I can do. I'm going to depend on you because you are so powerful because of your love for me. And I'm just going to throw myself on you. You know those moments where you're so tired and you just throw yourself on the bed? Oh, it feels so good. And you take off your socks and just the first time your feet hit the cold sheets, you're just laying there. The bed's just holding you. I mean, just that thought of just throwing yourself on God and saying, God, I can't stand on my own anymore and I need you to hold me. Like how refreshing that is to get to that place in time. And some of you are at that place in time where you need to throw yourself on God and finally put him first. With all the chaos and the mess and everything else that's going on in your life, you literally just need to throw yourself on God and say, I'm yours. Confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believing in your heart, God raised from the dead and saying, I'm yours. I want you. That's the beginning step of fearing God. As Andy would say, he had to get himself out of the way. That's all of us. That, that's, not, that's not Andy putting in his own words. That's Andy paraphrasing scripture because we're supposed to die to ourself, remove ourselves, and say, Lord, I need you where you put him first and you put his commands for saying, I'm willing to do things your way. And that's where the guy from Ecclesiastes, the author, he, he waited too long. He's like, I toiled for everything that I wanted. And now when I look back on my life, I've realized that it's meaningless. So there's nothing better than to fear God and obey his commands. Don't wait for the end of your life to understand your purpose and your duty. Understand, put him first, depend on him now. Follow his commands because they are good. They are good. And when you throw yourself on God and you come to the point of wanting to fear him, he gives you knowledge that comes from him and how you can do that. And that's where Proverbs is just filled with verses like Proverbs 14, 27. Well, this one, the fear of the Lord is fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. It brings life to us. Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life and whoever has it is rests satisfied that fearing God leads to a life of satisfaction. I think so many people have a false misconception of what it means to fear God. That fearing God sounds like a damper. Sounds like fearing God it sounds so negative, especially because we live in a culture of fear. Remember, that was one of the first questions that we asked in the sermon that I preached. The first time we did fearing God forever, I said, what are you afraid of? People are so afraid of things in this day and age. We fear what's happening in our lives. We fear what's happening in the Middle East. We fear losing our jobs. We fear if the door's locked, have you ever checked the door like three times in a row at night? Like, did you lock it? I don't know. Let's go check it one more time. <laughs> you know, let's just go check. I mean, we're driven by fear. People live in fear. But here's a question then. So why, why would a God who wants me to love him also want me to fear him? Why would a God that wants me to love him also want me to fear him? That's the thing. The fear of God in scripture, it differs from the fear of this world. It's a happy, healthy fear. It's a happy, healthy fear that shapes and controls all our other fears. That when you fear the Lord and you depend upon Him, you're not afraid of other things because you've thrown yourself on God. You depend upon Him. He's in control of all things. You know, I, I think one of the passages that really transformed my thinking this last year the most on what it means to fear God 
is the passage that I preached on Christmas Eve was Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. I'll, 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 I'll read it quickly, but here's what the passage says in regards to fearing the Lord. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And I, I loved this verse, and this just transformed my thinking and what it means to fear God as we are told about Jesus who's going to come to, to this earth and how the Spirit of God's going to rest on him in different ways. It can be the Spirit of the fear of the Lord will be on Jesus, and Jesus will delight in the fear of the Lord, that he'll want to fear the Father. That's what will drive him in his life. So point number two, what does it mean to fear God? Fearing God means delighting in him and being afraid of doing anything without him. That's, that's, that, those are some of my words right here. I mean, the, the fear of the world, if you think about this, think about the fears of the world. Many times it drives you away from God. But the fear of God in your life it keeps you from going away from him. That you have experienced his grace, you've experienced his love, you've experienced his power, that you, you want him in every aspect of your life and you're afraid of doing anything without him. Like, you just need him. And that's something that's, that's really helped me this year because I'm afraid of doing something without God in my life. I'm afraid of acting in a way that he would not approve. I'm afraid of writing a sermon that he would not be a part of or preaching a text where I take it out of context. I'm afraid of not loving Natalie the right way. I'm afraid of not raising my kids the right way. I'm afraid of this, leaving God out of my life. I think it's a big aspect of the fear of the Lord where you delight in God so much you think, God, I don't want to do anything without you because you're so good, you're so powerful. My life would never be the same without you. And that's what I would see is that the goodness of God in your life is the thing that will actually lead you to fear him the most. I saw that in Jeremiah chapter 33. It was the goodness of God in bringing his people back that actually gave them a heart to want to fear the Lord. If you think about the guy who wrote Amazing Grace, uh, John Newton, he even said that in one of his lines, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." That it was the grace of God and what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins. It was the goodness of God and how good he is to us in the midst of our sins that makes us think, Lord, I don't want to do anything without you. Think about the line in Amazing Grace, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and gave my fears release." It was like the grace of God that taught me to fear him and also the grace of God that released all the other fears because now I know that God's always going to be there for me. He's always going to help me. It's the goodness of God that leads us to fear him. And when we fear him, we're like, God, I, I want you in my life. I need you in my life. I'm going to depend upon you. I'm throwing myself on you. I'm delighting in this. What do you want me to do today? Well, he gives you wisdom. And Proverbs is filled with that. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of wisdom, the knowledge of the Holy One's insight. You put God first, you seek Him, He'll give you wisdom and what you need to do next. And what I hope to show, I'm, I'm just going to be firing out verses right now. I hope that you would see the fear of God is a good thing. Proverbs 14, 26 says, the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. You're confident when you fear God because you know, you know you've put Him first and the, and the results are in His hands and his children will have a refuge because a person who fears the Lord's being shaped by God. Their character's being shaped by God. They're putting themselves in a position to be used by God and their kids are blessed because of it, because of the person who fears the Lord. Proverbs 15, 16, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. I mean, just a little bit. Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's what we should be praising, a woman who fears God because that's a good thing. Psalm 34, 9, fear the Lord, you, his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. You fear the Lord, you put him first. God provides in ways that only he can. Isaiah 33, 6, the fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. 
And come to this point in time where Israel's repenting and, and Isaiah is telling them the greatest thing that our country has is the fear of the Lord. That's our treasure. No wonder why Jesus delighted in the fear of God. Like, I need you, Lord. I need you. Even ordering for Jesus to be faithful to the calling that God the Father <coughs> had given him. So when you think about the fear of God and we move on past this sermon series, never forget that fearing God is a good thing. Never forget that fearing God comes with benefits and blessings where the Lord will guide you to what he wants you to do next. You don't want to be without the fear of the Lord in your life. And even think about it this way, what could you be missing out on in your life because you don't fear God? What could you be missing out on in your life because you don't fear God? Because if you're putting yourself first, you're lacking something. Where the one who fears God lacks nothing at all. You know, we live in a culture where, what's the, what's the phrase, FOMO, fear of missing out, right? It's like the fear of missing out. Well, put that on a spiritual sense. In fact, Isaac Elliott, the director of our preteen ministry, said this, we need to have holy FOMO, which I like that, like a holy sense of like, man, if I don't do what God's calling me to do, what will I miss out on that he has for me? And my marriage in my kids, in my job, in just the simple act of being obedient to what God's calling me to do today. Application questions. Is there an area in your life where you are doing things on your own and living without God? Where would you need to put God first in your life today? How would you describe what it means to fear the Lord? I mean, wrestle with it. What have you learned? I'm telling you what I've learned. We're sharing what Andy learned. What did you learn we're saying fearing God means putting God first, depending upon him, throwing yourself on him, putting him first. Fearing God means delighting in him, wanting to do nothing without him. And the third thing I would say fearing God is fearing God forever means seeking him like treasure every day of your life and never giving up. That fearing God forever, it's not just a decision that you made to give your life to the Lord. It's like, okay, I fear the Lord. It's daily. It's a daily decision of, okay, Lord, am I going to walk in uprightness today and choose you, or am I going to be devious in my ways and show that I despise you? We have that decision every single day of our lives, and I feel it in the core of who I am, and I love the Lord with all my heart, and yet I'm still choosing whether or not I will fear God every day. Never stop fearing him seeking him in every decision that you have to make. Lord, how can I fear you today? What is it that you want me to do? Just like I mentioned Isaiah 33, 6, where it says the fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. The fear of the Lord has to become your treasure. It has to be what you value the most of like, Lord, how do I fear you in this? How do I fear you in this? How do I fear you in this relationship? How do I fear you in this season of life? How do I fear you in sickness? How do I fear you in brokenness? How do I fear you in this difficult conversation I'm going to have with this person? How do I fear you and honor you and depend upon you every single day of my life? Application question, is the fear of the Lord your treasure today? And if so, How? Proverbs 2, 1 through 5 talks about the fear of the Lord. Proverbs is filled with talking about the fear of the Lord. But I'll, I'll read this passage here. It says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commands with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and you search for it like hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. That if you're looking for it, if you're seeking it, if you're just saying, like, God, I need you, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Every single day with the new things that come up in your life, God will give you the wisdom that you need to do this. And we're constantly learning. I think it's so hard to define because we're constantly learning how to fear him today and tomorrow and the next day. Which is why David cries out in Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, 
that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Like he's figuring it out along the way. Like teach me, Lord, help me. Unite my heart. Unite my heart to fear you. Like help me to do this today. So what I hope that you'll see is it's ongoing. Lord, teach us how to do this today. It's not something that we're done with now that this theme is done, but really you're on a treasure hunt. You're on a treasure hunt. And you're either looking for the treasures that life has to offer or you're looking for the treasure of fearing God and how you honor him each step along the way. And the only reason why you'll stop seeking God and what he wants you to do is simply just because you get tired of doing it. I think that's what I saw in Jeremiah is just the weight of fearing God in a culture that did not fear him, he got tired. If there's one passage that I'll remember preaching this last year, it's probably the running with the horses passage. Uh, that, that, that was the one, just because I think, I think we can relate to that of just feeling like we want to give up sometimes and we're tired. In that verse, Jeremiah 12, 5, uh, God calls out to Jeremiah, if you've raced with men on foot and they have worn, have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? Of really God telling Jeremiah, you can't stop now. You feared me up to this point in time and now you're going to stop. What you've gone through so far is nothing. But you got to prepare yourself for the battles that are to come. You have to decide whether or not you're going to continue to seek me and fear me and run the race that I have for you. And you still have a race. If you're alive, you're on that race. And you have to decide whether or not you'll keep running, keep seeking, keep fearing God and living for him for the glory of his name until the day that he comes back or until the day that he dies where we will continue to fear the Lord forever in heaven. Because that's what people are doing in heaven. They've experienced his glory. They've experienced his greatness. They're depending upon him fully and they're giving him the worship that he deserves. So grow family, never stop fearing God. Seek him today. He'll give you wisdom how to do it if he's your greatest treasure. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Father, we love you and we praise you. And God, I ask that you would teach us to fear you. I pray that it would never stop. For the person in this room that's even just recognizing the fact that they have nothing in their life and maybe they need to give you a chance, I pray they would even follow Andy's example and come down and give their life to you today and receive you as Lord and Savior. For the rest of us who are believers, Lord, help us to run the race with the horses that you've called each one of us to run. Help us to fear you today and all the decisions that we have to make. Lord, help us to walk in in righteousness and integrity, showing that we fear you and help us not to despise you and do things that are devious. So Lord, show us how we can fear you today and every day for the glory of your name. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said... Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Amen, amen. If you're willing and if you're able, let's stand to our feet as we sing this last song together. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, because all that Just one move. I've got just one move with my arm. With my arm stretch wide. I will, I will worship you. Come on, church. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So that I, so that I have is a
these words with truth and say, so come on my soul and don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song because you got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. So you say, come on my soul. Get it. voices and worshiping with us today. If you're new to the Grove family, we'd love to get to know some more about you. You could go to your right at Guest Central. If you'd like prayer tonight, come on down to the front. We'll have praying partners just waiting for you. If you have a desire to give, we have giving baskets by the door. And also go outside. We have our family night happening right now, and we would love to have some good times with you. Have a great rearrangement of your night. God bless you all. (laughs) 